um, power of small. This could have also been uh, deconstruction. We have seen the universe deconstructed, we have seen management deconstructed, we have seen construction be de deconstructed and ego being deconstructed. And I'm going to deconstruct a cow for you, which might seem a little bit odd, and why would you do such a thing, and I will explain. Uh, first of all, um, are there any vegetarians in the room? It's hard to see about four or five, which is pretty much the, the, the average for the Netherlands for, and for every industrial uh, population. You can doze off for a while. Um, I'm talking to the meat eaters right now. Um, after five minutes, you can wake up because then it becomes really interesting. Um, but I'm first going to tell you what the problems are with uh, meat production. Um, so and it all has to do with that these animals, these pigs and cows, were never really designed and never had an evolution to serve as dinner for us. So um, they are not necessarily efficient, and in fact they are very, very inefficient. For every 15 grams of meat that we eat, we have to feed those animals 100 of grams of vegetable proteins. And so they have a bioconversion rate of uh, 15%. And already as we speak, Livestock is using 70% of all our arable lands um, in the world. And what's even worse, the World Health Organization is predicting that um, in 2050, meat consumption will be double what it is right now because of growing middle class in India, China, Brazil, Africa. So you can do the math, that's not going to work. Uh, we need to come up with a solution. That's not the only problem. So food security is serious, but that's not the only problem. Um, by now, we also know that these animals, being ruminants, actually um, excrete a whole lot of methane and uh, CO2. Now, the ruminologist among you might say, well, Actually, they don't fart methane, they belch methane. But you know, either way, it comes out, and it gets into our atmosphere, and it's a greenhouse gas. It's a very noxious greenhouse gas. So uh, that's another issue. 20% of all the greenhouse gas emission comes from livestock. So a um, vegetarian with a hummer is actually better for the environment than a meat eater, than a, a meat eater with a bicycle, right? <coughs> And then there's, of course, animal welfare issues. I won't dwell on it, but we all know it, and we sort of hide it, um, and we don't want to talk about it. So um, can we have a solution for that problem? And in fact, in 1932, Winston Churchill, of all people, um, uh, mentioned in his book, uh, Thoughts and Adventures, that um, you know, why would we actually grow an entire chicken if we only eat the breast and, and the wing? And he was befriended. He was, of course, a statesman, so what did he know about biology? But he had a friend, Alexis Carell, which was a Nobel Prize winning physiologist. And he, at the first time, at that time, could keep organs alive outside of the body. He couldn't make organs, he couldn't um, create them, but he could keep them alive outside of the body. And from then they went on dreaming, you know, what if we can also create these uh, organs? And at that time it just wasn't possible. But nowadays, thanks to the advances in, in the medical field, uh, we have stem cell technology and we have tissue engineering and we are getting there. So let's um, see how that works. Let's deconstruct this cow. You take a biopsy from a cow, um, that will give you a small piece of muscle, and muscle, of course, is the main ingredient of uh, meat. Not the only one, I will come back to that later. But we have this piece of muscle, and if you look at that piece of muscle under the microscope, you will see muscle, and you also see fat tissue, which gives some of the taste. And um, if you then um, look even closer at this material, you will see the skeletal muscle, the, the muscle cells, and there are tiny cells in there that are stem cells, muscle stem cells, that only can make muscle. They are sitting there waiting to repair the muscle once it's injured. Think about Robin at the uh, European Soccer Championship uh, three or four years ago. So, um, they're sitting there waiting to repair, and they have a couple of very nice characteristics. Being stem cells, they can divide, they can multiply to tremendous numbers. Actually, from one stem cell, we can make 10,000 kilos of meat, theoretically. So that's one of the crazy features of these cells. They can divide, they can multiply, they can make an entire mass of, uh, of muscle. But these particular skeletal muscle cells are even 
more um, sort of special because they merge. They have to merge because a muscle fiber is actually a large fiber with lots of nuclei. It's a merger of a number of cells. And they do that pretty much by themselves. The only thing that we do is we starve them. And once, once we starve them, they stop proliferating and they start to merge into large fibers. And then there is another um, cool thing that if you put them in a Petri dish, and you provide anchor points, and we use uh, Velcro for that, clitterbond. I bought this this uh, morning at uh, HEMA here in, uh, in um, Haarlem. And so we use actually the loop part of the uh, Velcro. Um, it works a little bit better than the hook part. Don't ask me why, but it's just empirical. Um, and we actually use the same from the HEMA. Um, and um, if you put that in your Petri dish and you provide anchor points for those cells, they start to grab on it. Um, they are actually exercise junkies, if you like. So they, we don't have to do anything. They exercise themselves. They grab onto these anchor points and provide tension. And they form a muscle. I will show a picture a little bit later. They form a muscle, provide tension, start to contract even. And um, that, with that, they will exercise themselves and they will grow tissue, muscle fibers, small muscle fibers. And if you just take a large number of those muscle fibers, 20,000 to be exact, you can example, uh, assemble a, um, a patty, uh, a hamburger. And that's exactly what we have done. Of course, you can also add fat to it. Now, this, this hamburger contains 60 billion cells. So that's a lot. You need to lot, culture a lot of cells, and you need to somehow find a way to, uh, to do that efficiently, because remember, we have to be more efficient than the cow or the pig. Um, currently, we're using a, a reasonably inefficient system for it, and eventually we're going to use a bioreactor, a silver tank like this, of 25,000 liters. That's a sizable uh, pool, an Olympic pool, I guess. Um, but with that, you can feed 40,000 people per year. So that's, that's already reasonable. Of course, I already said it has to be efficient and it has to also be meat, not some kind of substitute. We have more than enough substitutes from vegetable proteins. It needs really to be meat and um, nothing less, nothing more. So mimicry is very, very important. Now, what do you want in meat? You want, of course, taste. You want it to be red or pink or whatever, but not yellow or white. Um, and you want to have that particular mouthfeel of uh, the meat. So how do we do that? Well, currently, this is where we are. This hamburger on your uh, left was um, assembled a couple of weeks ago from uh, 8,000 of those muscle strips individually prepared and in these culture dishes, taken out, harvested, uh, making a patty out of it. And you see it's, it's pretty close, wouldn't you say? Reasonably close. And um, on the other side, you see the cooked one. Actually, we, uh, one is from uh, just a regular one uh, from a cow, and the other is ours. Um, and most of the people we fool by um, uh, letting them guess you know, which one is which, and it, they find it hard to tell. We did cheat a little bit here, uh, because we painted this um, uh, hamburger with uh, beet juice from red beets, which are actually purple. So we added a little bit of saffron to it to make it a little bit more yellow and red. Um, so the fibers are not quite red yet. They are yellow, to be honest, because there's no blood in the system. And what's more, there is no uh, myoglobin in the system, or not enough myoglobin. Myoglobin is a protein in those skeletal muscle cells that is very similar to hemoglobin in our blood. It turns red if it's exposed to oxygen, and muscle cells typically have a whole lot of it. Now, um, there are a fair amount of clues how you would um, induce that myoglobin in these uh, tissues, and a, a talented uh, postdoc in the lab started to work on actually starving the cells of oxygen. So low oxygen, we have systems for that, very easy to do. And then you see that myoglobin actually goes fivefold up. 
There was also a report that caffeine, which is kind of interesting, uh, caffeine would also induce that myoglobin. So the only thing is you couldn't eat hamburgers at night, but you know, that's a minor detail. Um, fortunately for us, um, the caffeine really didn't work. So we can um, revert to the lower oxygen and we can, uh, by, in that way, stimulate the myoglobin and turn our fibers into pink fibers. Uh, we haven't done that yet because we have only one of those incubators with a low oxygen capacity, so all the others are just regular oxygen, but that's just a matter of how you organize it. It can be done. Of course, we need to feed those cells. Now we get to uh, efficiency. We still need to feed them. We need to feed them sugars, we need to feed them amino acids, we need to feed them lipids, uh, which, by the way, also gives us opportunities to change, use the biochemistry of the cell, of that very smart cell, which we really don't do anything with other than feeding it um, and providing those anchor points. We uh, use the biochemistry of these cells to produce more polyunsaturated fatty acids. We know they can do it because if grazing animals have a higher um, uh, unsaturated, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid um, fat than animals being feed from a feedlot. So we know they have the capacity to do it, they just usually don't. So we can use that biochemistry in the lab because we have all those variables very tightly under control to make it more efficient, to provide those proteins and amino acids in the, in the right way, and to give um, uh, fatty acids to make it into a healthier uh, fat and a healthier burger. Um, so this is the system. It looks, uh, this is a, uh, looks like a refrigerator, but it's in fact the opposite. It's 37 degrees, like our body. We call it an incubator. Um, and the cells grow in there for a while. It takes about seven, eight weeks to grow a muscle fiber, uh, and so also seven, eight weeks to grow a hamburger. You could do that at home if you like. Um, uh, it needs quite a bit of space still, but um, eventually you can do it at home um, in, your, um, ref in your kitchen. If you have the right equipment, it's very, very easy to do. Um, and in fact, those stem cells, which is kind of interesting, they, you, you, you could envision, they, they survive freeze-drying, so you could envision that over the internet we would eventually sell little sort of tea bags of uh, stem cells from tuna, from uh, tiger, from uh, cows, from pigs, from whatever animal you can imagine. And then you could, in your own, in the comfort of your own kitchen, you could grow your own tissue. Uh, you would have to know eight weeks in advance what you want to eat, because it <laughs> takes a while. That, but that's a minor detail. Um, Anyway, so the, the process right now, what I'm trying to tell you, the process right now is not really efficient, um, but we have all the variables under control so that we eventually can make it efficient. And if we go from 2D to 3D culture, we actually make a huge step in efficiency. So that's our next uh, step. And we also are dreaming of feeding those um, uh, cells algae, saltwater algae. I'm thinking that the first factory is going to be at the mouth of the Mississippi, which is an algae dead zone, um, huge, huge algae dead zone, and we can harvest those algae there, uh, mesh them up, and feed them to our cells, because these cells are not very picky. So um, you could combine those technologies to make it even more efficient, and you can also build in recycling mechanisms to uh, improve the uh, efficiency. And then, of course, I already told you that these, these are exercise junkies. They really perform labor in there. But um, you know, we want to get from a muscle like this to uh, what I call a Schwarzenegger bull. Um, this is, in effect, a Blanc Bleu Belge. I don't know whether you recognize them. This is, um, it's a particular strain in, in Belgium. Um, and these animals actually have a mutation, a natural mutation in a protein that limits muscle growth. So we don't want limitation of muscle growth in the, in the Petri dish. So um, we all are also using the stem cells of these guys to see whether we can improve uh, protein concentration. Now this is the cool part. Um, imagine those cells where uh, we have taken them out of that biopsy, they grow out, grow out of that muscle, they have become from 1 to 10 to the 14 cells, 10,000 kilos of meat. And then we put them in a gel in between two anchor points, and you see that on uh, your left here. 
and it's a gel, um, and here the anchor points are not Velcro, but are silk wires, it's all the same. 24 hours after this, um, if you take the same picture, they have organized that gel, and they have organized it into a muscle fiber in between those anchor points. Basically already a muscle. Uh, and then they need another three weeks of maturing to build a full muscle. Now we can also electrically stimulate them, we can zap them, then they will contract uh, even more and they will produce fibers that are indistinguishable from the real thing. Um, but of course that takes a lot of energy and in fact our muscle in our body is not really electrically stimulated, it's chemically stimulated. So we might eventually uh, take another mechanism and give the chemical stimulus sort of in a repetitive manner to train those muscles even more. Now you would say skeletal muscle is not, only, is not the only component of meat. We want fat in there, we want really marbled uh, steaks, we want um, you know, juicy uh, stuff, and maybe you want a T-bone steak even if you're really into it. Um, so can you make that as well? And of course we can make that as well. We, we can pretty much make everything. Um, oh, excuse me, I'm going too fast a little bit. So we can make those, we can use those stem cells also to create fat tissue. And in fact we have already done that for the current um, prototype hamburger we haven't yet because it's really cumbersome to do them all at the same time uh, but it can be done and we have shown that it can be done and currently we're using that with very very uh, uh, methods that are compatible with uh, eating. Now currently we are making these small fibers which is good for processed meat such as, such as a hamburger and um, which is, by the way, about 50% of all the meat pr uh, consumption. So, you know, uh, even if we would stick to that, we would already make a big step ahead. But uh, my ambition is actually to make a steak or a pork chop. So um, what would you need to do? Um, that's a limitation of tissue engineering because the thicker the tissue gets, the, the inside cells will be deprived of nutrients and of oxygen. So we'll, they, will, they will start to die. So that's why we have blood vessels, and um, uh, I also make blood vessels. I would like to make blood vessels. It's not particularly necessary in these tissues because we don't have any blood. But we still need a channel system um, to, and a flow system to get all the nutrients and oxygen to all the nooks and crannies of the tissue. And uh, that can be done. Um, friends of mine in uh, California have a 3D printer where you 3D print basically a steak. You print the cells and you print the material and you print those little tubes in a hierarchical, hierarchical manner. And you have an inflow and an outflow and you can create, in principle, thicker tissues. So eventually we can create steaks and pork chops if you, again, are into it. Okay, so then there is another final challenge minor one, will people ever eat this? It's coming out of a factory or out, out of a lab even, it's sort of Frankensteinish, um, creepy, um, you know, whatever. So will people um, eat this? And if you uh, go with a, with a microphone through the streets of Harlem and you will sort of randomly ask people, it'll say, no way, you know, are you, are you out of your mind? Um, but if you rephrase the question and say, well, you know, let's, 20 years from now you walk into a supermarket and you see those two products, those two meats. One is made in the lab, it has an Erlenmeyer on it, and it's cheap, and it has the same price, the same um, uh, taste, and the same color, and the same mouthfeel. And you have this other product that now is an Ecotex, is four times more expensive because it's scarce. And it also has this nasty little label that animals have suffered for that product. What are you going to choose? You know, um, I bet the choice is uh, going to be, you know, favorable in terms uh, for, for this particular product. Currently, this hamburger costs 250,000 euros. Um, and I, I like to stress that, uh, and also to make the point that it's not a real product yet. It's a proof of concept showing to the world, guys, we can do this. We can make this product in a in an efficient way. We actually have done some calculations which come down to a much re more reasonable price. Um, but we can do this. And my ambition is to gather a lot of people and a lot of money to do all the research that's required to sort of uh, take out all the small obstacles and get this into, uh, onto your plates, basically. Thank you.